Hi everyone, my name is Nabil Qureshi. I have the privilege of speaking to you from Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Today's topic is going to be God and medicine. Uh, this is a very broad topic. It would actually take many, many weeks to cover, uh, but I'm going to share from you a, a basic amount of what I feel like people really need to grapple with, what people need to come to know when they understand that God and medicine are not separate topics. They are fundamentally joined. And I understand that many who are watching this talk are probably going to be Christian, uh, but I'd like to aim my talk at a much broader audience. My hope is that anyone who's interested in science, anyone who's interested in medicine, would learn and gain from this talk. Uh, I also hope uh, that uh, as you come up with questions, as you hear what we have to say, that you will send those in. Um, the instructions should be readily available for you to send your questions in to email or text them. We'll be taking some of them at the end of this talk. My name is Nabil Qureshi. I do have a background in medicine, and in fact, uh, my, my journey began, uh, my journey to Christianity uh, and in Christianity began while I was in medical school. <clears throat> I graduated from medical school in 2009, um, and just so we are clear, I didn't go into a medical profession after that. I then continued my graduate study of religion. And some might wonder, well, why is that, Nabil? Why did you go from medicine into religion? I actually find that the two are very closely connected. Um, you know, having a Muslim background and now uh, being a Christian and then uh, going into medicine for a while, uh, all of these things purport to explain the world around us. Uh, and so I don't think I did two disparate things by doing graduate studies of Islam and Christianity and medicine. All of those uh, fields do talk about the explanation of the world around us. And that's what my interest is. What is this world actually like? Who, if anyone, has created us? What is he like? What we, can we learn about him through science? What does he do to science? These are the kinds of things that I think are really important questions. I remember while I was in medical school, a lot of the students that were going through the school with me had a lot of questions, uh, questions that were never answered uh, in their education. And most of them just simply brushed them off and kept going, didn't bother to answer those questions. Those questions are things like, why am I here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? What purpose is there to this job that I'm working? And very specific memories come to mind of spending the night in the ER while on call, seeing patients come in who simply needed a place to stay. These were people who needed food and shelter, and they would come into the ER and they would know that if they complained of chest pain, uh, they would have to be put into the ER overnight and they'd receive food. Uh, of course, this comes at a cost to the hospital, to potentially taxpayers. About $1,000 to $1,500 per night was what it was in that specific hospital. And we're thinking, is this what medicine is all about? Are these the people we're trying to help. Uh, and it was a very jading time. So the answers to the questions about life, about human value, about purpose, to me, were what kept me going. And I think it's critical for any of you who are in the medical field to understand the answers to these questions, or at least continue thinking about them. Don't put them off. If you have friends who are in the medical field, especially if you have friends who are in the medical professions and are agnostic or atheist, I do hope you'll share this talk with them um, and, and pass it on. Hopefully it will be something that will be an encouragement to them as well. As I was preparing this morning, I went to see what the news headlines were. And it's just fascinating how that much interplay there is between God and science, specifically God and medicine, even in the news, although it's sometimes not easily seen. For example, this morning I saw that the third physician, I'm sorry, a third American, the second physician, uh, has been stricken with Ebola and is being flown to the United States soon. Uh, that's fascinating. You just stop and think about the controversy that happened a few days ago. Uh, we had two Americans stricken with Ebola who were flown to the United States, and you had many people who took to their blogs, who took to the radio, who took to television to say that we should not let these Americans back into the country with this disease. Of course, Ebola was introduced into the United States uh, decades ago, but not this virulent a strain. And so people are worried that Ebola could potentially affect this country. An interesting bioethical issue, an interesting technological issue, and certainly one which consumed many people just a few days ago. But the implications of this issue, I find, are directly tied to what we think about God. 
Why were these American physicians there in Africa in the first place? Uh, who were they helping? Uh, is their life valuable enough to risk the lives of 300 million plus Americans? These questions, which we're all assessing whether or not we know it when we're talking about the debate of bringing these American physicians back into the U.S., we're all assessing these questions, but some of us don't, don't do it cognizant of the implications on God and theology that are here. Another thing that I found in the news this morning was that the United Nations is calling for $600 million to combat the Ebola uh, epidemic in Africa. <clears throat> That's an interesting issue as well. Uh, 1,900 people have succumbed to Ebola in the past few weeks. Uh, are we willing to spend $600 million for what could potentially be a rather small epidemic? Of course, I'm not saying that's my position, but these are the kinds of questions that arise. Well, couldn't those $600 million be used in other kinds of research? Couldn't it be used in taking care of the elderly? Couldn't it be used in research on cancer and AIDS? So fund allocation, how we're going to use the money that we have. We don't have infinite amounts of money. We have to decide which money goes where. These questions tie in to our worldview. How much is a human life worth? How much are certain diseases posing problems? And quite often we strive to answer these questions without having first considered our theological perspective, our worldview. So even these issues today in the news, and you know, there was another one in the news today, which I think is more easily connected to our theology. The World Health Organization has called for a reduction or, or an, at least an attempt to reduce the amount of suicides occurring globally. The number cited was 800,000 people kill themselves each year. I think it's pretty clear that there are theological implications here, worldview implications on this question. Should we allow people to kill themselves? And obviously the World Health Organization is saying we should impede people from doing so. Well, why? Don't they have the right to kill themselves if they want? Uh, if, if people are just here to enjoy life, and some of the bioethics books that I have read use that as its basic premise, life is to be enjoyed. Uh, that's how we measure the utility of life. Well, if that's what people are here for and they're not enjoying life anymore, why not let them kill themselves? Or is there some kind of inherent value to life by which, citing which, we should prohibit people from killing themselves or impede that? And under what circumstances? should we do that? If you have uh, an ailing elderly person who's in pain, should we prohibit them from killing themselves? Physician-assisted suicide has become legal in certain nations. Uh, is, is that something that's immoral? All of these questions have strong theological ties, which, simply put, are often ignored by those who are making policies, but more importantly, by us. We, we often just jump to answer the questions without realizing that the answers to these questions are based on our perspective of life, our perspective of humanity, which is ultimately theologically derived. So I do want to talk about this uh, in, in the context of bioethics. Um, in their introduction to bioethics, Shannon and Cochler stated this, traditional disciplines that participated in one way or another in the field of uh, bioethics include theology, philosophy, medicine, law, and biology. So uh, these two scholars have written out five fields uh, that traditionally affect bioethics. The first one they cited is theology, and yet I see that constantly ignored by those who are addressing these issues. I myself, uh, to give you an example, um, took a bioethics course while in medical school. Interestingly enough, it wasn't required. Uh, this course was a fourth year elective for me. And in fact, those of us who took this elective were often seen as lightweights. You know, why didn't you do more surgery? Why didn't you do, you know, more of this or that? Instead, you took a bioethics course. So we're actually looked down upon for having taken this course. And then while I was in the course, I noticed that four of these five disciplines were directly addressed, but theology was left out pretty clearly. Interestingly enough, along with philosophy, I think it's the most foundational of those disciplines. So, to summarize my introduction here, what I want to get across is that bioethics 
the issues are all around us from the perennial issues of abortion and stem cell research to HMO issues like physician compensation and ER overnight policies to future issues such as genetic engineering and population control. All these questions which are going to consume a lot of us in the future and are consuming many of us now really strongly depend upon people's worldviews, uh, their perspectives that I think directly are related to their view about God and the universe, but we simply ignore that. I'm hoping during this talk we can agree on a basis of discussion for these issues which can show that this is actually important, the theology in science. Now, right off the bat, when I mention God and science, sometimes people just immediately want to do a timeout and say, aren't these two incompatible? God on the one hand, science on the other. Uh, you know, faith requires you to believe things blindly, whereas science is a time-tested and honored method of knowing things about the world around us. Uh, aren't these two at odds? <clears throat> In this next section, I would like to talk about how that's not really the case. Now, if we take faith as, by definition, blind faith, an ignorant faith that results from simply believing what you're told, then yes, it can be seen as at odds with science. But I want to emphasize that most thinkers throughout history, most theologians and religious thinkers throughout history, have not understood faith to be a blind faith. In fact, biblically speaking and from the origins of Christian history, faith is supposed to be something that's understood as the result of evidence. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you a, an example. When I come home, usually from a variety of trips that I, that I go on, I usually fly back on Delta because I live in Atlanta and Delta is the headquarters. When I get on a plane, I am not assuming that the plane is going to explode. I am not assuming that the plane is going to be rerouted. I'm assuming that the plane is going to start where it took off and where it pl was planned to take off and it will end up where it was planned to end. Now, I honestly, generally don't have any evidence towards that claim. For example, I have not went and checked the engine on the airplane. I don't know if the fuselage is well sealed. I don't know if the pilots are sober. I haven't checked out the parking gear. So I have no direct evidence to sustain that claim. So should I get on that plane, given the fact that I haven't a shred of evidence that it's going to arrive at its destination? The answer is obvious. Yes, I should. Why? Because I can have faith in Delta as an airline. You see, Delta has a track record. They have their own systems of checking and their own systems of investigating. And based on their reputation, who I know them to be, I can trust their claim that I will arrive at my intended destination. Whether or not it's on time or with my bags is another issue, but I can trust that I will ultimately get there. The same thing is the case for faith in, for example, uh, my car, faith in my wife, and faith in God. The Christian faith is based on a track record. In the case of the Christian message, we see this claim in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul makes it very clear. He says, if Jesus is not risen, our faith is in vain. Go to verse, verses 14 and 17 to look at this. What he's saying is, we know God exists. Look at the, I mean, if you look at the rest of, of Paul's writings, you can see he's talked about a God who's evident to the world. Romans chapter 1 does that, for example. But he says that Jesus has been raised. This is the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15. And then he goes on to say, because of this evidence, this resurrection that we know has happened because people have seen it and have interacted with it, because of that evidence, we can have faith in the Christian message. Now, some of you might be arguing or jumping out of your seat saying, Nabil, of course, the resurrection is something to take on faith too. Um, that's something that I would like to discuss uh, at another point in time. I think we can have good reason to conclude that the resurrection happened even now. But at least you'll have to concede in Paul's time, there were people who were still alive. And in fact, that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 through 8 are saying, that people saw the risen Jesus. And because of that evidence, we can have faith in the Christian message. So faith from the very beginning of the Christian message has been something to base upon evidence. When it comes to science then, 
how is it different from faith? If we base our view upon science um, on solely what we ourselves have observed and seen, we will be lacking abysmally in our understanding of the universe. What do I mean by that? The vast majority of what you know, even if you're a scientist, the vast majority of what you know is based on what other people have told you. Even if you are an astronomer, uh, the process of, of creating the current uh, th framework of astronomy was something that you didn't participate in. It took hundreds of years before you. Uh, if you are dealing with things like molecular and cellular biology, have you yourself ever tested uh, what components exist in a cell membrane? Have you yourself ever seen DNA with your own eyes uh, or the, the double helix of DNA? Have you seen all of these things? You may have seen one or two of them, sure. I, I don't want you to get me wrong. But the vast majority of what you know, even as a scientist, is something that has been told to you. Now, am I arguing that you shouldn't have faith? No, you should have faith in this system. It's produced excellent results. Um, but that goes to show that faith and science aren't opposed to one another. In fact, they go even deeper. The reliance of science upon non-scientific foundations is pretty strong. Maybe I should use the word meta scientific foundations. But here's what I mean by this. In order to do science, we have to assume certain philosophical truths. The scientific method is not actually science. It's a philosophy. It's an approach to the universe. You have to first assume that the universe is something that you can objectively test. Science can never verify that. Um, the universe, the perception of the universe through our five senses, uh, that is something that we just assume is relatively accurate. Uh, people who've been studying the philosophy of science have repeatedly emphasized that practitioners of science, scientists and clinical practitioners, etc., simply take for granted things that shouldn't be taken for granted. Let me give you an example. This, is, this might get a bit complex, but this goes to show how intertwined philosophy and science and religion actually are. When we make conclusions on science, one of the foundational ideas of science is that the world around us should be explained by repeated observations that we can do through experiments to verify conclusions from other scientists. So it's not just that Isaac Newton uh, first identifies what gravity is. We can all then test that later in the lab. This process of verifying facts is called inference, induction, inference by induction. Um, so I've seen something many times, therefore that will continue to be the case. Uh, this method is very different from uh, coming up with knowledge by deduction. So whereas 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a deductive conclusion, it follows by the rules of mathematics, inductive conclusions are simply repeated observations that we expect to be the same every time. This is actually how science works, by induction, inference by induction. To quote um, Samir Okasha, a lecturer of philosophy at the University of York in England, he says, the word proof should strictly only be used when we're dealing with deductive inferences. In this strict sense of the word, scientific hypotheses can rarely, if ever, be proven true by the data. To restate, Scientific hypotheses can rarely, if ever, be proved true by the data because they're inductive inferences. <clears throat> now, the father of modern critical thought, or at least I would say he is one, is David Hume, the Scottish philosopher. His position was that induction is simply human blind faith. He says, well, just because something has happened multiple times doesn't mean it will happen again. And he's technically right. It doesn't necessarily mean that. And so he concludes, therefore, that science or the process that science uses is blind faith. This is David Hume, who's laid the foundation for much critical thinking. In fact, if you're a scientist who denies that miracles happen, uh, down the line, you can be probably pretty certain that Hume is the one who made that claim, uh, uh, a widely believed claim, that miracles don't happen. The same man is saying science, because it uses inductive reasoning for the most part, is blind faith. Very interesting. So <clears throat> what science actually is, is a system 
that we use in order to strengthen the ways we receive knowledge such that they're the best they can possibly be. According to Thomas Dixon, senior lecturer of history at uh, Queen Mary um, in England, says the following, the whole project of modern science could be summarized as the attempt to weave individually relatively feeble threads into a more resilient web of knowledge. What are these threads here he's saying that are relatively feeble? Well, the way that we receive knowledge from the universe around us comes through four avenues. The first is senses. Your five senses are what we use in order to receive knowledge of the universe around us. Um, whether it be through sight, through hearing, uh, that's our primary method of interaction with the universe. And then technologically and scientifically speaking, we use tools to further strengthen those senses. For example, sight. We will use microscopes to, to hone down on very small sized things or telescopes to, to look up at the cosmos. These scientific tools are helping us by strengthening one of the existent four avenues of receiving knowledge, the senses. Then we also have a collective testimony. In other words, when scientists publish things, what they're doing is they're using the common tool of testimony, but doing so in a strengthened way in order to come up with scientific conclusions. So, how do I receive knowledge, for example, of my birth date, that I was born in April of 1983? Well, frankly, it's testimony. I listened to my parents. Uh, we didn't have, you know, little Twitter or photos to take at the time, so my parents told me I was born in April of 1983. I believe them through their testimony. Scientists also use testimony, but it's called publishing. And they're using the results of other scientists that have been published in, in their studies, and they're believing them that they didn't fudge the data. Of course, they will use the third avenue of, of gaining knowledge in order to test that, and that's their reason. They will look at their methodology, and they will see if this methodology was valid to prove their claims. So the third avenue, reason, is also strengthened by scientific enterprise. And the fourth avenue is memory. Um, the way I know certain things is because I remember that they happened. The way I know what I ate for breakfast, a granola bar, was that I remember that. Uh, the way it works for scientists is they also have a collective memory through the accreted tradition of published materials. And so the way that normal humans, not scientists, interact with the world around them and learn things through four avenues of senses, reason, testimony, and memory, scientists use the exact same avenues. They just have methods for strengthening those avenues. What's the takeaway? The takeaway is all four of these avenues are fallible. Our senses can deceive us. Our testimony can deceive us. The testimony of others, that is. Uh, our memory can be fallible and so can our reasoning. Uh, science is simply doing the best it can to strengthen the available tools we have to know the world around us. Science, therefore, is not some paragon of knowledge. The only way we can receive knowledge, which is kind of a view of scientism, uh, it's one tool by which we can interact with the world around us. A good one, don't get me wrong, uh, but just one of many. You won't get answers like, should we do certain things through science? Uh, science will often work through a mandate uh, that if we can do it, we must do it. And we've seen such things happen, for example, with cloning. Before we ever resolved the issue on a debate of whether or not we should clone mammals, people had gone ahead and done it. Um, and so the question of whether we should do something is not knowledge that can be gained by science. It must be gained through fields like ethics, through fields like philosophy. Uh, but those fields are non-scientific. So here, I just wanted to pose the point that science has a very direct correlation uh, and, and dependence upon things like philosophy. And I'll show you in the next section that it also has a dependence upon things like theology. To summarize this point, science and religion are two sides of the same coin. Both are trying to explain the world around us. Both are trying to tell us why the world exists the way it does. Science does it one way, religion does another, but they're both interdependent. Science often speaking into religion and religion often speaking in to science. And we shouldn't be disparaging in our approach to one or the other. Uh, oftentimes as a Christian, I've seen some Christians dis dismiss scientists. Uh, that's poor thinking. Um, but equally poor thinking is when scientists dismiss theologians as if they don't know what they're 
you're talking about. No, the two things work hand in hand, and we should understand the interaction between these two very noble fields. <clears throat> so as we move forward, I want to talk about the impact of God on science, specifically God on medicine. As I started off earlier mentioning these issues in the news, I think it's important to realize that there is a very, very important need for us to understand our theological foundations as we head into the scientific enterprise. These doctors who are coming back from Africa with Ebola, they went there for the same reason that I went into medicine, for the same reason I'm sure that many of you who are medical professionals have gone into your field, and that was to help people. The assumption here is that people are worth helping. Now, even in voicing that, many of you might say, of course, Nabil, that's a given. The fact that you have to think about that makes me wonder if you're a decent human. Uh, I understand where that kind of reaction can come from. But that's how deeply ingrained it is in us that humans have value. But where does that assumption come from? I, I want to take a moment to emphasize the way in which we, as students and practitioners and scientists, um, have come to understand the world around us. I was trained in public schools. I then went to a university, which is a state university, for my undergraduate degree. And then for my medical school training, I went to a medical university where I was taught basically this story of the world around us. The universe began to exist via a big bang. Now, I'm not here to, to tell you that that's false. Uh, for those of you who don't believe in a Big Bang, there are good reasons why people believe that. They take their telescopes and point it up into the sky and they can see a redshift, a Doppler effect in the universe, whereby we can conclude that things are moving further and further away from one another. Well, if they're moving further and further away from one another, they must have began at one central location. This is how the scientists make their case about the Big Bang. What was never explored by my professors was who started the Big Bang? How did it start? This question was just ignored, and I would say conspicuously ignored. Ignored. If you're talking about the origin of the universe and you point to a process, well, processes have causes. Everything that comes into being has a cause. And if the universe just came into being, what was its cause? That question is just simply ignored. And for the time being, let's go ahead and ignore that question. Although I think that there's a significant problem in doing that. Let's keep going. As the universe came into existence, galaxies were formed in, in nanoseconds, in picoseconds, parts of the galaxy, parts of the universe were formed and just spread all over the cosmos. Well, as these galaxies were forming, there was one very particular galaxy that was able to sustain life. Uh, it's called the Milky Way. And we know this because it's not just a chocolate bar, it's the galaxy in which we live. In the Milky Way, there happened to be multiple arms. Uh, it's a spiral galaxy, so there are multiple arms of that galaxy, and the only place where life can be sustained in that galaxy is in an armpit region just in between two arms. Well, you zoom in on one of those, and we happen to find a solar system in which contains our Earth. A very, very specific set of circumstances needs to be just right in order for life to exist. There's a lot more. In order for the Earth to be able to sustain life, it has to be part of a single star solar system, not a binary, binary or multiple star solar system. It needs to be just far enough away from the sun, not too far, not too close. Uh, otherwise, life as we know it would not be sustainable. This Earth needs to have an asteroid belt shielding it from cosmic debris. Uh, otherwise, the, the Earth would simply not be able to sustain life. It would be constantly pelted. Um, the atmosphere has to be just right. All these factors have to be just right. Now, why am I bringing this up? Again, conspicuously, uh, professors and teachers will teach you all of these facts, and they are facts, but they won't ever address the reason behind those facts. Why or how is it that the world is so finely tuned to sustain life? Uh, it isn't just these, these cosmological factors um, or these astronomical factors, but there are other factors that have to be just right in order for life to be sustained. For example, the strength of gravity or the strength of the strong nuclear force. It has to be just right in order for life to exist. 
Some of you might be wondering, Nabil, uh, it is what it is. Therefore, life has just happened to be this way. I'm not sure that that's a good answer to the question. Um, I remember hearing a lecture from someone who works with us at RZIM. His name is John Lennox. He said, if you were lined up in front of a firing squad and a hundred people took aim at you with their rifles, and when it came time to fire, they fired, and every single one of them missed, and you walked away just fine, you're probably going to walk away saying, thank you, God. You're not going to walk away saying, well, it just so happened that every gun misfired. That doesn't explain it. It doesn't explain what happened. And when so many things are happen to be perfectly aligned and we just happen to survive as a species and live, I have to ask, as does the person who survived the execution, how are we possibly alive at this moment? There must have been some kind of conspiracy to give me life at this time. But ignoring all that, let's just put all that aside. We didn't talk about that in our schools. We didn't talk about the theological implications of any of this. All we were left with was the bare fact that the universe was started by a Big Bang, and here we are on the Earth. And then somehow, through biological, chemical, physical processes, a single-celled organism came into being. And that life then, through processes of blind evolution, as it was repeatedly stated to me, we came to exist as humans. Now, putting aside all the difficulties with that theory, let's just run with it. What does that mean for humanity? What does that mean for you? If you are the product of blind evolution, that means that you are a cosmic byproduct. As the universe exploded, it just happened to explode in such a way that you exist. And your life has no more ultimate purpose or meaning or value than does the chair you're sitting on or the computer you're watching this on. That is what it means if God does not exist. You might stop me there and say, Nabil, no, human life has more value than that. Even I'm an agnostic and an atheist, I can tell you that life has more value than that. I can see where you're coming from, but generally speaking, that value is one of two kinds. Either it's a utilitarian value, that human life is only valuable insofar as it's a tool, just like a computer or a chair. Or number two, that human life has experiential value. Because it can experience things, it has value. Well, that would lead me to ask the question, what about someone who is comatose? Is their life not valuable? Uh, these are the kinds of questions that we have to wrestle with. And I would argue that if we base our system of human value on either experience or utility, we run into tremendous problems. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm appealing to you as a medical professional or as someone interested in God and science and someone interested in humanity. I'm pretty sure you love people, whoever you are. Why is a person worth loving if they're just a clump of carbon and nitrogen? <laughs> what, what makes them any more valuable than anything else? The thing is, we know our hearts testify, and, and this isn't an argument for the existence of God, but I think it's an explanation of the way we exist. We know people are more valuable than that. That's why people like me and others have entered into the medical field. It's why people went to Africa, even at the risk of catching Ebola. It's because people have value. And that simply cannot be explained from an atheist or agnostic worldview. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that atheists and agnostics don't value human life. That's not what I'm saying at all. Some of the most decent and kind people I know are atheists and agnostics. I'm not lumping them into a category of mean people. But what I am saying is that their worldview does not sustain their character. Their worldview cannot explain their take on life. Uh, there's an inconsistency here. And if we approach the issue of human value, which we must when we talk about things like euthanasia, like abortion, like physician-assisted suicide, any of these issues, uh, even fund allocation, as we talked about uh, the hundreds of millions of dollars to be spent uh, on stopping Ebola, um, why? Why spend the money doing that? Why not spend the money doing other things? The assumption is that human life is more valuable. 
But that simply cannot be sustained in a system apart from God. That's how important God is to medicine when it comes to human value. Of course, there is another issue um, which is extremely important uh, where you need God in the case of human life, and that is ethics. What should we do in certain circumstances? As I said before, uh, generally speaking, when we approach humans uh, and, and decision making from a godless system, we end up with what I would call either a consequentialist um, ethic or a utilitarian ethic, um, and, and, and basically where the ends are justified by the means. I have a very specific memory from that fourth year medical school class that I talk, was talking about earlier where a question was posed to the class, and I was shocked by their response. The question was a good one. It was a bioethical scenario where 10 patients are ailing. They all need organs or they will die soon. One person is healthy. Should we take the organs from that one healthy person and give it to the 10 ailing people to help them live? At the cost of one life, you save 10. Should we not do that? As we explored the issue as a class, a twist was thrown in. What if those 10 people are wealthy philanthropists who are going to improve the world, and that one person is a serial killer and rapist? Can we then take his organs and give it to those 10 philanthropists? As I was intrigued and frankly shocked to find out, a large number of people in my class were willing to say that we should kill the one person in order to save the 10, even before it was thrown in that that one was a serial killer. People just said, hey, in order to have more life, we should be willing to kill this one person. That was shocking to me, but it also underscores what happens when you take God out of the equation, because life becomes a matter of utility. It becomes a matter of functionality. Similar thing happened um, in World War II in Germany with the Holocaust. Now, I'm not here to, to defend this position. I, I wish I could right now, but I just simply don't have the time. Uh, when I've spoken on this before, people have attacked me saying that Hitler was using a Christian worldview and that the Holocaust was a Christian enterprise. Uh, I think that is a telescopic and narrow view of what actually happened. Um, there's actually much more that shows that the framework which Hitler was using was based on eugenics, a model which was developed from the biological evolutionary uh, theology uh, theories that were permeating society at the time. So, what was happening with the Holocaust? Let's give Hitler the most benefit of the doubt that we can. What he was doing was saying, there is a superior race, they are human, in order to help them survive, we should eradicate any weaker blood. We should eradicate the weakness in society to help those who are strong remain alive. Now think about this for just one moment. If we just happen to be cosmic byproducts and we happen to have life, then whatever utility and value there is to life can only be sustained by increasing life's chances for survival. That's all that can be done. And so, in order, therefore, to maximize the potential of life, we must do whatever it takes, whatever uh, means necessary to sustain that life. What Hitler did was a natural consequence I think, of atheism and agnosticism. Now, I'm not saying it's the only natural consequence, but I think it was to be expected, given a non-God-based system and worldview. Um, when we start arguing that the Jews, even if, and of course they didn't have less value, but even if they had less value, as people who believe in God, we could believe that God gave them value, and therefore, for that reason alone, we should be against the Holocaust. But if they're just lumps of carbon, then why not eradicate them? That's the kind of thinking that we begin to risk when we take God out of the equation. Once again, please don't get me wrong. Atheists and agnostics aren't all Nazis. That's not my point. Um, and it doesn't demand that kind of perspective, but it certainly allows for it in a way that a God-based worldview, especially a Judeo-Christian worldview, simply would not allow for that kind of a thing. What's my point? 
My point is here that once we remove God from our equation, we unhinge the anchor of morality. All of a sudden, morality becomes what we agree for it to be. Why not rape and kill one another? Well, because we've agreed not to rape and kill one another. If you harm someone, you are potentially running the risk of being harmed yourself. Therefore, let's all agree to not harm one another. That's the basic social contract on which our morality exists apart from the existence of God. Of course, there's much more to this issue. But the point that I want to get across is when you introduce God into the equation, you ground our ethics and morality into reality. And it is from that perspective that we can now say, come what may, I am not going to kill any life, even if it saves 10, because that life has been given value by God. So, human value in and of itself, ethics and morality, these require God. Interestingly, a lot of people don't notice this, but the very enterprise of using reasoning actually relies upon God. Let me explain this. If you believe in a blind evolutionary model, what happened to humanity is that it accrued various characteristics that helped it survive uh, from one point to the next to the next, survival of the fittest, and you get to a point where what we have is finely tuned to help us to survive. What does that mean about our ability to reason? What it means is that our reasoning doesn't actually necessarily tell us about reality. It tells us what we need to know in order to survive. You can't necessarily trust it for actual truth, just for survival truth. Therefore, we can't really trust our reasoning to tell us real truths from an evolutionary model. To see more on this argumentation or this line of argumentation, I would go to the scholar uh, from Notre Dame, uh, Alvin Plantinga, who's really developed this line of thought. But it's striking that many who use reasoning every single day don't realize that their reliance upon that reasoning is predicated upon the existence of a God who gave us the ability to actually interact with reality. Of course, as we mentioned before, the explanatory power of theism is powerful when it comes to things like the anthropic principle or the fine-tuning of the world. Uh, God explains a lot of that. Some people would argue, though, that the explanatory power of God is simply a God of the gaps argument, that we invoke God to explain things that don't make sense otherwise. Uh, I think that reasoning is somewhat short-sighted. Um, it often depends upon the context, it often depends upon the thing being explained, but a clear refutation of at least a uniform God of the gaps approach to exist, uh, the arguments for the existence of God is intelligent design. Now, the intelligent design movement has been maligned uh, pretty commonly, and I think whenever I've seen uh, the critics of intelligent design, what they're criticizing is not what the movement is claiming, so it's kind of a straw man fallacy. What the intelligent design movement is doing is it's saying you can detect the presence of intelligence based on evidence, not a God of the gaps argument, based on evidence you can detect an intelligent mind. What does that look like? Well, the theory behind that is something that we actually used, for example, in the 90s when we were engaged in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. If you've heard of the SETI project, that's what it was doing. It would aim its telescopes and instruments into the sky and hope to receive information which would be a message. And once a message was received, it would be clear that a mind had given that message and therefore we could conclude that there is intelligent life out there. So the very premise of the SETI program is the exact same premise of the intelligent design movement, that all around us, we have evidence that an intelligent mind has created this world. And it's based upon that evidence that the argumentation is made. Of course, things like DNA contain in it messages. Messages come from minds. And if you argue with that kind of reasoning, I, I would hope you'd be consistent and argue with the same reasoning that was used by the atheists and agnostic scientists who were part of running the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So it's not always a God of the gaps argument as some people would allege. The explanatory power of God's existence is powerful. It explains why the universe exists. It explains why 
you exist, why we care about one another, why love is a real thing. Also why, for example, sentient life is a real thing. We haven't been able to figure that out from an evolutionary, a blind evolutionary model. Um, all of these things, uh, life, love, art, music, sentience, consciousness, all of these things, the, the fact that there's anything instead of nothing, much better explained on a theistic perspective than an atheistic or agnostic perspective. Now, some people might say, but Nabil, uh, in the past, um, there were explanations uh, for things that were wrong. And I'm sure that as science has proven things in the past that we thought God best explained, moving forward, we will find more explanations. Science will find more explanations for these things we haven't been able to explain. I would say maybe you're right. Maybe you're right, but that's called faith. That's called faith in science. Uh, and I would much rather have faith in a person than a process. So just remember, may, you might be right, but that's faith as well. And for those of you who are relying upon that kind of a perspective, I hope you do see how faith is as much a part of it as it is a theistic perspective. Now, everything I've been discussing so far has been how theism interacts with science and how it's important, uh, especially for a practice like medicine, to have an understanding of human value and purpose and such coming from the existence of God. But as I conclude, I want to bring in not just theism, but the Christian message, the gospel. What Christianity teaches is not just that God created the universe and that that can explain the world around us, but that God, again, this is the Judeo-Christian perspective, God, who didn't need humans at all, created this world, and then in order to help and serve them, which is what the New Testament tells us, God enters into the world to suffer on behalf of people who could never help him, who could, he never needed. I mean, what is a human going to do for God when God is all-powerful? So according to the Christian perspective, God entered into this world and was willing to suffer for those who couldn't help him at all. Does it make sense why those of us who are in the medical profession often have the same desire to go places, to, to serve people where they couldn't be served who would not be helped any other way? When these physicians are going to Africa to help patients who have Ebola, trust me, they're not doing it because those Ebola patients can help them in some way. They're doing it because they've been created in the image of a God who did the same thing. The Christian message empowers us by showing us that even, even the sun and the sky and the stars and these majestic, mind-boggling, beautiful things, that all of them pale in comparison to the value of human life. Because human life is the only thing that has the Creator's image upon it in this universe. Again, this is just a Judeo-Christian perspective, but it shows us why we can live with the desire and, in fact, a duty to serve the world around us. It's very powerful, especially when you juxtapose it with an agnostic or atheistic model of the universe. When it comes to practices like medicine in the fields of science, I would argue and contend and stand by the position that the Judeo-Christian worldview, specifically the Christian worldview, enables us to do far more good and love this broken world far more than any other worldview can. I do hope to talk more about that in the near future. On December 18th, I will be doing another broadcast. So if you have more questions in the interim, feel free to write them down and send them then. But we do have questions now that we're going to address. Some of you have sent questions in and we'll be taking them for the next 12 minutes or so. So the first question uh, that we have received uh, says, I'm 24 with chronic kidney disease. After six years of atheism, I'm coming to grips with God's existence. But how can I know that spirituality is more than just comfort seeking? This is a great question. Um, and I can't imagine uh, the depths of uh, self-exploration that you've had to go through in order to even voice the question. Uh, at 24 with chronic kidney disease, you've been through a lot. Um, and so please forgive me if my answers seem kind of blasé um, or that they don't deal with the issue. I hope they do. Many people have accused Christianity of being a crutch. 
of just being the way to survive um, and, you know, just hoping for uh, an afterlife. I don't think that accurately deals with what Christianity is claiming, nor does it deal with the evidence at hand. Uh, I was a Muslim the majority of my life. Um, I had to give up a fair amount in order to accept the Christian message. The reason why I did that was because Christianity explained the world better than Islam did. It explained history better. It explained Jesus better. Um, it explains certain ethics better. Um, and, and this isn't a talk about Islam, so I'm not going to go into details there. But my point is, I didn't do it for a crutch. And so many people throughout Christian history have suffered for Christianity, not because it's a crutch, but because it's a truth. Now, you might be asking the question, well, Nabil, how can I know that? Well, again, for one, as I mentioned before, the universe makes more sense on a theistic model than an atheistic model. And to quote my friend Frank Turek, it would take more faith for me to be an atheist than it would for me to be a Christian. Um, I would have to be able to explain without any ability to do so the existence of life, the formation of life, um, the existence of sentience, of, of true morality, um, all these things, the fine-tuning of the universe. From an atheistic perspective, I would simply need to believe that it happened somehow by faith and have faith that science will somehow explain it in the future. Whereas as a Christian, I have a reason for it all, much more explanatory power. Um, but also, I would like to encourage you, you can have a relationship with God. Now, this might sound like crazy Christian talk, and who expected to hear this on a talk of medicine and God? But I believe that God interacts in this world today, just how he did 2,000 years ago by dying on the cross for us, just as he did when he created the universe. He interacts with us, and we can have a personal relationship with him. So my friend, uh, at 24 years old with the chronic kidney disease, I, just will, I will certainly pray for you when this broadcast is done, uh, that God will heal you. He can and does do that even today. Uh, I want you to know that your life has value, that nothing that's happened to you is an accident. You know, the Christian worldview is the only one that I've seen where seeing our suffering, God enters into this world out of love for you. Other worldviews, God sees the suffering and stands back and judges people. Not this Christian worldview. God enters into it. He rolls up his sleeves and says, I'm going to suffer alongside you. And as much as you have suffered, Jesus has also suffered crucifixion. Uh, you know, the crucifixion process was so horrible, so ex extremely painful that they had to develop a word uh, to describe the pain that Jesus felt on the cross. It's called excruciating, which is Latin for excrus, out of the cross. So if you're going through pain, know that God loves you and that he's gone through it too. And that this is the only worldview where God loves you enough to suffer alongside you. And he's a God who can heal you. And he's a God, a God that you can experience. Just pray and seek him. And I have no doubt out of his grace and mercy, he'll reach down to you. We're going to go to the next question. We have about eight minutes left. Dr. Qureshi, what is your take on mental illness, psychiatry, and the Christian faith? Well, for one, I'd like to say, call me Nabil. Uh, for two, I would like to say that I spent a lot of time uh, as a medical student studying psychiatry. My fourth year, I did an acting internship where I was acting as uh, a medical resident in the psychiatry ward, and I was specifically interested in things like depression. Uh, to give you a story, it just shook my, shook my world. Um, there was a man who came in, uh, upper 50s, lower 60s, and he was stone cold. I mean, the look on his face, just as if he couldn't feel anything. And the reason he was there was because he attempted to commit suicide. And he just had no feeling. He had no emotion. He just wanted to die. Uh, when we asked him, what do you like doing? He says, I don't like doing anything anymore. Well, what gives you joy? Nothing gives me joy. That's a symptom called anhedonia. Um, it, there was just nothing that was getting through to him. What our um, psychiatrist decided to do uh, was something I didn't know people still did, electroshock therapy. Um, so we gave him some paralytic agents and then uh, using either monopolar or bipolar uh, electroshock therapy, I don't remember which, we shocked him. And then after that, we went to have an interview with him. This man had a total 180 degree turn. All of a sudden, his eyes were full of life. He couldn't wait to see his grandkids. He's excited to get out the hospital to do all these projects that he hadn't done in a long time. Total reversal. 
of his view on life. And when I was interviewing him, I interviewed him before and after, it hit me just how powerfully our minds, our psyches, our souls are interacting with our physical bodies. Now, some people would say that this points as evidence to the fact that there is no such thing as a soul. We're just a body. I think that's jumping the gun a bit. I think like Aristotle argued, the soul is animated. Uh, I mean, the body is animated by the soul, kind of like a glove is animated by a hand inside it. Um, when we die, I think we will be released of all the bonds of this human body. So does depression happen? Absolutely it does. Is some of it spiritual? Absolutely. There is spiritual depression. I believe that there's oppression of spirits on people, but there is also chemical depression and medication can help. I've seen it. Um, so. That's my encouragement towards you. Once again, God is a God who walks with you through the spiritual afflictions and the physical ones. When we turn to the example of Jesus, he healed people of physical afflictions and spiritual ones. So turn to Jesus. Don't feel like if you have depression that you're some kind of anomaly or that you're, that you're somehow hated by God. You are not. You are loved. And there are people around you who love you too. And you can turn to a God who can heal you. Uh, will he? That's kind of up to him. But I hope that you can trust him because he loves us far more than we can ever imagine. I will pray for you as well after this or, or your friends as it, as it might be. What are your views on embryonic stem cell research? This is a very interesting question. Um, there are multiple types of stem cell research, um, and as technology advances, there will be more. Within stem cells, there is a characteristic called plasticity. Depending on how early in um, the embryonic development we find that stem cell, and in fact, even as adult humans, we have some plasticity within our stem cells now. Um, Bone marrow, for example, consistently makes different types of cells. Um, cells for blood, cells for immunity, etc. So. There is plasticity within certain cells. You can actually take uh, a hematopoietic stem cell, a stem cell that's designed to make certain factors in your blood, and turn that into a nerve cell. Um, that's what plasticity is about. Early on in embryonic development, you have what's called a totipotent stem cell. So when the sperm and the egg uh, are fused together and create a zygote, that's a single cell, which then becomes two, which becomes four and eight, etc. During that early phase, um, any of those cells can become a whole person. Um, so that's what it means to be totipotent. But then even after that point, as more differentiation happens, you go from a gastrulation stage into multiple germ layers, all of these things, they still have the ability to differentiate. Even uh, um, uh, the uh, umbilical cords can sometimes have um, be used for stem cell research. My position is that beyond embryonic stem cell research, anything from the umbilical cord, for example, or anything from an adult or something that doesn't require the death of a developing embryo, any of that is perfectly fine. And a lot of that is what's happening today in stem cell research. So before we just shut ourselves off from all research, we should take a look at what kind it is. But when it comes to killing um, something that can become a full human, um, I would adjure us to all be very careful. You could be committing murder. Um, now, some people would say, we don't have evidence that that's a life. Uh, that's not what I said. I said, you could be committing murder. And I'm not sure if you want to run the risk of killing people. Um, I'm not here. I don't think we have the time to address the issue of uh, does life start at birth or not. There are various positions about that, even within the Christian realm. I'm not going to take one right now. It takes too much time. But I think we can all at least be on the same page that even running the risk of killing someone is a bad thing. And so that's why I'm against stem cell research that would destroy a potentially living being. The next question, um, I know this will be our last one. I know without God, there is no good or evil, but what is God going to do about the evil now? From ISIS to 27 million trapped in sex trade. This is a very real question, a very powerful question. What is God going to do now about the evil in the world? Um, it's extremely powerful considering we're here in Atlanta. Uh, those of you who are, who are in Atlanta, we're recording from here. This is the sex slavery capital of the United States. Um, 
horrible to think that right now people are being trafficked. Uh, of course, ISIS is growing and the evil in the world is obvious. If you don't see evil in the world, then you haven't looked around enough or you're denying your humanity, one or the other. What is God going to do? God has already done a lot um, and he will do more. So for one, I do believe that God has in his sovereignty created this universe for a greater purpose. And I know this might sound like magic Christian talk, uh, but is there a purpose to all this suffering? I believe absolutely, yes, there is. Um, one image that's used by my colleague Vince Vitale in the UK is one that resonates with me. When you walk into a labor and delivery room and you see a child being born, if you just took a snapshot of that moment, you would say that birth is probably the worst thing that could happen. You've got a mother who is screaming, potentially bleeding in all kinds of pain. You've got nurses who are scrambling to do things. You've got doctors who are as well anxious and making sure that this baby, this life will be sustained. You have a father who's not particularly helping in any way, but he's pacing and worried too. You've got all this going on in the labor delivery room. If someone just saw a snapshot of that and that's all they knew about human life, they would say, this is horrible. Life is about suffering, about bleeding, about anxiety, about death. Um, but if we take a step back and we see a year or two or three later, a burgeoning family full of love, full of shared experiences, caring for one another, laughing together, all of a sudden that moment in context is made a lot more beautiful. This life, yes, is full of tragic suffering. But I believe, as the Judeo-Christian worldview teaches, specifically as the gospel teaches, that this life is just the beginning. It is the birth pains of a much longer, beautiful, familial relationship with our loving Creator, who is the source of all joy and all life and of all happiness. Things are good because God is good and we can be with Him for all eternity. That is what makes this life worth it. And in order to do that, God had to separate, uh, had to destroy the chasm that separates us from him. When we sin, what we're doing is we're saying to the sustainer of the universe, I'm turning away from you. We're making a decision to walk away from the one who gives us life. Well, if we walk away from life, what does that mean? It means we're gonna get death. When we walk away from the source of joy and peace and happiness, what are we going to get? We're going to get despair. We're going to get fear. We're going to get the opposite of love, whatever that is. And all of that, I believe, is what happens when we sin. The only way, because again, we're walking away from the source, that's what's going to happen. It's a natural consequence. In order for God to defeat ISIS, in order for God to rescue 27 million people trapped in the sex trade, what he's done is he's destroyed that chasm that separates us from him so that we can have eternal life with him in joy and in bliss forever. It's very hard to do when we're going through this suffering to stay broad-minded and not to focus on this. But the fact of the matter is, if God doesn't exist, the suffering is pointless. These lives are pointless. There's no such thing as evil. But if God does exist, then that evil will be defeated. This life will be vindicated. And human life has ultimate value, has the value of God's image placed upon it. So God already has done much and he will do an eternal amount more for all these people who are suffering. Right now, though, I'm just hoping and more focused on those who are listening. This world is suffering. This world is suffering horribly. And I believe God has chosen humans to be his instrument in reaching out to this world. The people who need food, we can give them our food. The people who need clothing, we can give them our clothing. The people who need help, we can give them our help. We don't have to worry about this life. We can even die in this pursuit because God has given us an eternal afterlife. That is the Christian message. We're going to talk about that more you know, on December 18th. But to, to wrap it all up, those two physicians who contracted Ebola in Africa, the second of whom is coming to the United States very soon, they did that because they believed 
this message. They were both Christians and they believe that the lives of others are more important than their own lives because they will have an eternal life. Do you have that kind of confidence? Are you willing to serve people even to your death? If you want that, you will want what our Savior has done for us. And I would adjure you to follow Him, to know Him, to learn more about Him, to pray before Him, to accept Him as your Savior, and to walk with Him. And your life will never be the same. Only when we come from that perspective can we infuse our practice of medicine and science with the value it actually has. Thank you so much for giving me time today. I pray that, uh, that this talk will have encouraged you. And please, if it has, send it on to others who might need similar encouragement. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon.